When people hear the word fusion, they usually imagine the heart of the sun or giant reactors reaching temperatures of millions of degrees. Fusion is the process where two atomic nuclei smash together to form a heavier nucleus, releasing massive amounts of energy. But in 1989, two chemists, Martin Fleischmann and Stanley Pons, shocked the world by claiming that nuclear fusion could be triggered inside a small laboratory setup at room temperature using ordinary materials. This idea became known as cold fusion. It raised an exciting but controversial question. Can nuclear reactions really happen without extreme heat? In their experiment, Fleischmann and Pons used electrolysis. They passed electric current through heavy water, which contains deuterium, a form of hydrogen, with a palladium electrode. Palladium is a metal that absorbs hydrogen like a sponge. They believed that under the right conditions, deuterium atoms packed inside the palladium lattice could fuse, releasing excess heat, far more than could be explained by chemistry alone. If true, this would mean a new kind of clean, cheap, and limitless energy, the holy grail of energy science. But almost immediately, other scientists tried to repeat the experiment and failed. The scientific community became skeptical. Critics pointed out that no clear nuclear byproducts like neutrons or helium in sufficient amounts were consistently observed. Without such signatures, how could it be fusion? Skepticism turned to backlash. Cold fusion was labeled pathological science, and most mainstream journals stopped publishing on the topic. For many years, it became a cautionary tale of hype and scientific overreach. Yet the story did not end there. A small but persistent group of researchers continued investigating cold fusion, often rebranding it as low-energy nuclear reactions, Lenner, to escape the stigma. They designed more precise experiments, improved measurement tools, and claimed to detect tiny but real amounts of excess heat helium-4, and even transmuted elements under special conditions. So the question returned, were we too quick to dismiss cold fusion? <laughs> what makes this idea so hard to accept is the Coulomb barrier, the natural repulsion between positively charged nuclei. Under normal conditions, you need high temperatures, like in stars, to overcome this barrier. So how could it happen at room temperature? Some hypotheses suggest that quantum tunneling lattice effects, or electron screening inside the metal could lower the barrier locally, allowing fusion-like events in very rare circumstances. But these theories remain speculative and unproven. You might wonder, is there any working cold fusion device today? No. Despite decades of research, no one has built a commercially available cold fusion reactor. Some companies, like Brilu and Energy and Clean Planet, claim promising results, but they remain unverified by the wider scientific community. Mainstream physics still requires robust, reproducible evidence before accepting room temperature fusion as real. However, the controversy has had positive effects. It inspired better research in solid-state nuclear science, anomalous heat generation, and materials under extreme stress. Some researchers believe the key to success lies not in repeating past experiments, but in developing new theoretical models that combine nuclear physics with condensed matter science where atomic environments can drastically alter reaction probability. So can nuclear reactions occur at room temperature? The answer for now is possibly, but not reliably or predictably enough to be accepted as mainstream science. The idea remains on the fringe, but its potential, if proven, would be enormous. It reminds us that scientific revolutions often begin with controversial questions, and that even discredited ideas can sometimes point the way to new discoveries. Cold fusion refers to the hypothetical process of nuclear fusion occurring at or near room temperature, rather than at the millions of degrees required in stars or hydrogen bombs. The concept gained fame in 1989 when Martin Fleshman and Stanley Pans claimed that deuterium nuclei fused in palladium electrodes producing excess heat without radiation. This contradicted conventional nuclear physics, which predicts that nuclei must overcome immense Coulomb repulsion, something only possible at high thermal energies. In theory, if nuclei could tunnel through the repulsion barrier via quantum effects, fusion could occur under unusual conditions. However, these claims have been widely disputed due to poor reproducibility and lack of expected nuclear byproducts. Fleischmann and Pons reported calorimetric measurements showing unexplained heat generation from an electrochemical cell. It's like claiming ice can spontaneously boil water without a stove. <laughs> so surprising, it demands extraordinary evidence. For two atomic nuclei to fuse, they must approach within a femtometer scale distance, overcoming the electrostatic repulsion, 
Coulomb barrier between their positive charges. In stars, this is achieved via extreme heat and pressure, enabling nuclei to collide with sufficient kinetic energy. At room temperature, such conditions are absent and classical models forbid significant fusion rates. Quantum tunneling offers a probabilistic loophole, but the likelihood is astronomically low at ambient energies. This makes cold fusion, as traditionally imagined, seem physically implausible under standard models. The probability of two deuterons fusing at room temperature via tunneling is estimated to be less than 1060 per second. It's like expecting two people to pass through a brick wall simultaneously without breaking it. Palladium can absorb large amounts of deuterium, forming a metal hydride lattice where deuterium atoms reside in close proximity. Proponents argue that the electron-rich environment and lattice constraints may reduce effective repulsion and increase quantum tunneling probability. Theoretical models suggest that phonon interactions or coherent oscillations in the lattice might assist in energy concentration or shielding. Still, mainstream physics asserts that no known mechanism within such a lattice lowers the barrier enough for meaningful fusion. Experimental setups have rarely shown consistent evidence for nuclear signatures, such as neutrons or tritium, expected from fusion. In some experiments, palladium rods reportedly expanded due to excess heat without corresponding radiation or neutron detection. It was like loading gunpowder into a soft pillow and expecting an explosion without a spark. One of the major criticisms of cold fusion research is the inability to consistently replicate results across independent labs. While some groups report anomalous heat or isotopic shifts, others find nothing beyond experimental noise. Critics attribute positive findings to calorimetric error, contamination, or flawed methodology. The field's credibility suffered due to the early media rush and lack of peer-reviewed confirmation in 1989. As a result, mainstream science labeled cold fusion as fringe or pseudoscience, despite ongoing niche research efforts. MIT and Caltech attempts to reproduce the Fleischmann-Pons results failed, leading to public retractions and skepticism. It's like dozens of chefs trying the same recipe, but only one claims to taste something magical without explaining how. Many cold fusion proponents claim the detection of excess heat unaccounted for by chemical reactions. Calorimetry, the science of heat measurement, is extremely sensitive to environmental factors like insulation, electrolyte changes, and electrode surface area. Critics argue that these excess heat claims often fall within measurement uncertainty or lack proper baselines. Supporters counter that some experiments produce energy densities far exceeding chemical limits, suggesting a nuclear origin. The debate continues over whether this heat is real, reproducible, and nuclear in origin. Some cells reportedly produced heat equivalent to several megajoules without detectable chemical fuel. It's like finding a warm stove in a locked room and debating whether it was on or just poorly insulated. If cold fusion is genuinely occurring, it should produce nuclear byproducts like neutrons, helium-4, or tritium, depending on the fusion pathway. Most experiments, however, either fail to detect these or report them at levels inconsistent with the measured heat. For instance, if deuterium-deuterium fusion occurs, one expects either helium-3 and a neutron, or tritium and a... Some researchers have claimed detection of helium-4 in heat-producing cells, but results are often contested for lack of proper controls or contamination issues. Without clear nuclear evidence, claims of cold fusion remain speculative. Helium-4 detection has been cited in some high-profile cold fusion claims, but without corresponding neutron counts. It's like hearing fireworks but never finding the smoke. Something is missing in the chain of evidence. Several alternative models have been proposed to explain cold fusion phenomena, including low-energy nuclear reactions, Lenner, hydrino states, quantum coherence in metal lattices, or collective excitations. Some propose that non-classical mechanisms such as local energy concentration or electron screening might enable rare fusion-like events. Others suggest exotic states of hydrogen or plasma clusters might bypass normal nuclear rules. However, these theories are highly speculative and often lack rigorous mathematical or experimental validation. They remain outside mainstream nuclear physics and are not widely accepted. The weta marsin theory proposes weak interaction-based neutron formation in metal hydrides as an alternative to fusion. Like suggesting a secret shortcut through a mountain when the road clearly goes around, it needs solid proof to be believed. 
The scientific community's response to cold fusion has ranged from caution to outright dismissal, with few institutions willing to fund or support large-scale investigations. However, private research groups, defense agencies, and startups have quietly continued exploration under terms like Lenner or condensed matter nuclear science. Some governments have shown intermittent interest due to the potential of clean, compact energy. Nonetheless, academic journals and grant agencies remain skeptical, often rejecting cold fusion papers regardless of content. This has created a polarized ecosystem where data exists but lacks widespread validation or peer endorsement. The U.S. Department of Energy conducted reviews in 1989 and 2004 both concluding that evidence was inconclusive but merited further study, like a locked vault labeled treasure? People are curious, but few have the key or are willing to try. If cold fusion or an lenr like process is ever demonstrated beyond doubt, it would revolutionize energy production, nuclear physics, and even planetary science. A compact, safe, and low-radiation fusion source could power homes, vehicles, and space missions with deuterium from seawater. However, without reproducible evidence and theoretical grounding, cold fusion remains a high-risk, high reward research avenue. Its legacy highlights the tension between scientific conservatism and exploratory freedom. Continued investigation may yet uncover unknown low-energy nuclear processes or finally close the chapter on cold fusion. If real, cold fusion would offer energy millions of times denser than chemical fuels with minimal environmental impact. It's like chasing a ghost in the machine. Elusive, intriguing, and potentially paradigm-shifting if ever confirmed. 